Good afternoon. We normally do this on Tuesdays, but um, for some reason, my recording this past Tuesday failed, and I have failed to get a copy of the one I missed while I was traveling, and that uh, Brother Shane Dietrich stood in for me. So in uh, an effort to get this taken care of, I'm going to go ahead and try to record two lessons this afternoon uh, to go up on the, the website. And we're going to look at 2 Samuel, and we're going to look at 1 Kings. And in the New Testament, we're going to look at Ephesians and um, Philippians. And then we're going to try to cover uh, a good portion of Christology today. So as we start here with the second um, second Samuel, um, first Samuel is basically a book about Saul, though there are some stories of David in it, some histories of David in it. The second uh, Samuel is mostly about King David. Uh, the author is Nathan, obviously God, um, because all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness, that the man of God may be uh, throughly furnished unto all good works, may be perfect, which is complete, throughly furnished unto all good works. We know that holy men of old spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So Nathan is the author, and then Ezra, Nehemiah, or possibly Jeremiah, uh, are credited with... Um, compiling this into a book. The chief uh, text or the key verse of uh, 1st and 2nd Samuel is found in 1st Samuel 10, 25. Then Samuel told the people the manner of the kingdom and wrote it in a book and laid it up before the Lord. And Samuel sent all the people away, every man to his own house. This book was, uh, the date of this book is about 940 BC during the 40 year reign of King David. The main characters are David, who wanted to build a house for God, uh, but the sin of idleness got him, and that idleness, you know, empty wagons rattle. Uh, I used to hear my dad say his uh, teacher in school told him that <clears throat> uh, when you don't have something to do, David should have been out with his military. Uh, he should have been facing the enemy, but instead he stayed home to look over his kingdom and saw a young lady taking a bath, and so his idleness uh, opened the door to the lust. And, you know, you couldn't stop yourself from seeing this person, but he could have not called her to the house. And then that adultery turned into an, uh, what we might say is an undesirable pregnancy, uh, what we might, would say today. Uh, and then he called Uriah home from the war, trying to get Uriah to... Uh, <clears throat> basically go in into his wife so that he might think this child is his own. But <clears throat> instead, uh, Uriah had too much character. He said he couldn't go into his wife when his friends were out to battle. And so David even, you know, the Bible says, woe unto the man that gives drink to his neighbor's lips. And David actually gave drink to um, Uriah, trying to get Uriah to, to, give in to the temptation to, to go in into his wife. But he was a man of great character, obviously, who went uh, and slept on his porch rather than going into his wife. And then uh, David deceived and tried to cover this up by marrying Bathsheba. These are some main characters that go on uh, that we see in the book. Uh, and the occasion of the book is both the trouble and the triumph in the life of a believer. Triumph when we live by faith. Trouble when we live according to the flesh. Now, I got to tell you uh, <clears throat> that a lot of people use David as an excuse. And they go, look, David was a man after God's own heart. And see, he committed adultery. So God doesn't care what you do with your sexual life. That is a very unlearned thing to say, though I have heard men in the pulpit say it. Okay? David never had another victory after he committed adultery. David was forgiven, it's true. I believe we will see David in heaven, it's true. But David lost his testimony. And my friends, in this life, especially when it comes to Christians, when you lose your testimony, you have lost it all. We get trouble 
when we live according to the flesh rather than according to faith. The special features, hey, there is more written about David than any other character in God's word. In 2 Samuel chapter 12, Nathan tells David basically of his sin. He uses a hypothetical situation. He says, hey, David, there's a rich man uh, lived down in the valley and he's got flocks upon flocks and herds upon herds. And there's a, there's a, there's a poor man up in the hills there, or vice versa. I forget the exact location of the two people, but there's a rich man and a poor man. The rich man's got flocks and flocks and herds and herds and money and money. And the poor man's got one little ewe lamb and he takes that ewe lamb into the house. The ewe lamb is part of the family. And when the traveler came to the rich man, rather than sl slaying one of his own flock, he went and took the poor man's one little ewe lamb and slew it and cooked it and fed it to his guest. David said, he'll pay with his life. So he calls, he pronounces death upon himself, basically, with a fourfold repayment of the loss of the sheep. And Nathaniel, or Nathan said to him, thou art the man. And David is uh, smitten on the spot, we might say, with the truth that that's what he did. David had more than one wife. Now, I don't think that was God's plan. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, David did have more than one wife. And instead of taking one of his own wives, he called for another man's one wife to come to him. And he lay with her. So David pronounces judgment upon himself. Psalm 51 is his psalm of repentance. 2 Samuel 22 is a psalm of praise. We're going to get to the eight covenants in just a second. The Bible, oops, oh man, hate it when that kind of thing happens. Now I got to get us back there. Okay, here we are back in 2 Samuel. Let's do it this way. Bible principles never change. We need to every day look for God's plan and our place in it. God has something, whether I'm talking to Jeremy or Damaris or anybody else that might listen to this recording, God has something for you to do that someone else cannot do like God would have you do it. You need to look for your place in God's plan, amen? So kind of an outline to the book is The Great Triumph. Uh, David's great triumph in chapters 1 to 10, we see the civil war, the conquest in chapters 5 and 6, the covenant in chapter 7, and then the crowning years in chapters 8 and 10. In chapters 11 and 12, we see the great transgression of David, his sin, his lust in 11, his loss in 12, David's great troubles in 13 to 24, uh, the trouble with the children, the baby dies, Amnon rapes his sister. Absalom kills Amnon. Absalom rebels against the David, against the King David, his own father. You see what I'm talking about? David got into sin here, and the rest of the book is about the trouble that came from David's sin. Don't let somebody tell you that God doesn't care about your conduct. Yes, he will save any man, but he loves you too much to leave you there. He will change your life, and if you, in rebellion, or complacency, fall back into sin, he will forgive you, but he does not take away the temporal or earthly consequences of our sin. If I were to go out and get drunk today and have a wreck and lose my arm, well, I could ask the Lord's forgiveness and I feel sure he would give it to me, but my arm's not going to grow back. God's not taking away the temporal consequences of my sin as a believer, he or as an unbeliever for that matter. He's not going to, to, to do that, but he will forgive you. But we should not, as believers, um, presume upon God's good graces, right? Uh, we should go boldly before the throne to obtain grace to, to and find mercy to help in time of, to obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The book of Hebrews tells us. And so we should daily ask God to keep us from those things. In fact, in the model prayer, uh, I used to hype and, 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 and harp on the fact that, well, it's not meant for us to repeat it. Well, if you read the words of Scripture in, in, in the recording in 
Matthew, he says, as you pray, pray after this manner. But if you read it in Luke, it does kind of sound like, well, maybe he'd want you to say those exact words. So whether you take that and you use it as a template for exactly how you pray, or maybe you use those exact words to begin your prayer before you specifically ask for things in your life, however you see fit to use that, it clearly teaches us that every day we ask for the needs of that day. Now, the pictures and prophecies of Jesus Christ, the promises made to Abraham are also made to David. Christ in the eternal kingdom, the throne, the seed, all of these things are um, mentioned in 2 Samuel 2, David, and then they're mentioned again in Luke 1. David typifies Christ. Now, we just said that he's a great sinner, but he was a man after God's own heart until that great sin. Mephibosheth typifies the sinner. Mephibosheth was the grandson of Saul. His legs had been broken through an accident when he was a child and he was crippled. But David asked, did any of Jonathan's relatives live that he could show grace to? Because he had promised Jonathan he would show grace to his kin and Mephibosheth was left. So even though he's this crippled man, his legs were broken and, and healed improperly. I think maybe even his hands, but definitely his legs were broken. And David brought him. He sat at David's table. Uh, he ate David's food. He was cared for uh, by David until David's death. Uh, Mephibosheth was living in Lodabar. Lodabar means barren, but he was brought to the table for Jonathan's sake, right? And we know that in Ephesians 4, 32, uh, be you tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. That is what we're talking about here. So let's look at the second page. Eight covenants, all right? These are eight Bible covenants. We see the Edenic covenant, which it ordered life in the garden. Then the Adamic uh, covenant, which ordered life outside the garden after man had fallen into sin. The Noahic covenant, which ordered life after the flood. The Abrahamic covenant in Genesis 12, 1 to 3, which is a sevenfold promise. The Mosaic covenant, which is the law in the Old Testament. The Davidic covenant, which provides for the throne, the house, and the kingdom. The Palestinian covenant, which is Israel's future. And the new covenant, which you and I live under. These are some covenants from the scriptures. Now, let's move to 1 Kings. 1 Kings, we could say, is the book of the divided kingdom. It is an authorship, is uncertain, but Jewish tradition says that Jeremiah the prophet wrote this book. Internal evidence seems to back up this supposition. The key verses we see in chapter 2 and verse number 12 that Solomon sat upon the throne of David his father and his kingdom was established greatly. 1 Kings chapter 9, we see that this is the reason of the levy which Solomon, King Solomon raised for to build the house of the Lord and his own house. And 11.11, 11, I will rend the kingdom from thee. So the kingdom was divided. It was taken from the son. The son listened to Rehoboam, Listen to the um, advice of his uh, friends over the advice of the older men. The older men said, hey, Solomon taxed us pretty hard to build the temple and to build his house. You should, you should you know, do some Reagan, Reaganomics, right? We should do some trickle down uh, economics. We should cut the taxes so that the little man can survive, if you will. But he didn't do that. He, oh, I'm what? What? What was uh, my father's thigh of taxes is going to be my little finger of taxes? So ten tribes separated them. Uh, Jeroboam being the king of one, uh, two, and uh, Rehoboam being the king of the ten. So it's the divided kingdom. The main characters, we see the crowning of Solomon in chapter 1. We see the wisdom in chapter 3. Uh, he actually prayed for wisdom and not wealth and affluence and understand and, and all these different, you know, wealth and influence and things of that nature. So God 
uh, said, because you asked for wisdom, I'm going to give you both wisdom and wealth. I'm going to give you both affluence and influence, all right? Solomon completes the, the temple. The glory of the Lord filled the temple. But then Solomon kind of went into apostasy. Basically, Solomon wrote Proverbs, or the greater part of Proverbs, Song of Solomon and Ecclesiastes. Proverbs is probably when he's a young man. Song of Solomon might have been when... Uh, um, I'm sorry. Song of Solomon is probably when he's a young man. Proverbs, I believe, also when he was young. When he's old, he wrote Ecclesiastes. Because Solomon had 300 wives and 700 concubines, or vice versa. And so, uh, you know, he was drawn away from the Lord by these other wives, which he took, I'm sure, for political purpose. You know, if I marry your daughter, you're not likely to attack me. Um, but uh, he allowed them to worship these other gods. Um, and so um, Solomon was drawn away in apostasy. But when we see the book of Ecclesiastes, which is, it's also, it means the preacher, uh, in his later years, he had looked at those things, um, or he had tried all those things in his middle years, and in his later years, he came back to say, hey, I tried wine, and it was vanity. It was empty. It was nothing to it. I tried women. Hey, I had a thousand of them, but it's it's empty, and the it doesn't give you satisfaction to have all of this uh, enjoyment sexually. Um, he tried education. He he tried all these different things, and he said, under the sun, everything is vanity and vexation of spirit. Nothing provides the contentment that Saul was, excuse me, that Solomon was looking for. And so we see the conclusion of the whole matter in the last chapter of Ecclesiastes, fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. So the kingdom is divided, and we get into Ahab and Jezebel. Uh, Jezebel is like, as bad probably as Solomon's thousand women in drawing Ahab farther away from the Lord. And then uh, Elijah comes on the scene in chapter 17 and he says, hey, I may be just a country preacher, just Elijah from Tish, Elijah the Tishbite, if you will. Uh, but uh, it's not going to rain till I say so. Now, we mentioned earlier the Lord's Prayer teaches us to pray daily for our sustenance. God didn't even give Elijah enough sustenance for the day. The, the ravens, the crows, if you will, brought uh, him food uh, morning and evening. That's You got to trust God to just not know where your next meal is coming from and get it from some birds twice a day. He didn't have a Coca-Cola. He didn't have a cup of coffee. He didn't have a monster or a Red Bull. He's just drinking from the brook. All right, and then the brook dried up. He didn't quit on God. God told him to go down to Zarephath and let a widow take care of him. And and you know he gets there and he tells her, "Hey, bring me some water." She says, "Okay." He says, "Go ahead and make me something to eat while you're doing that." She said, "I I got I'm gonna cook a little cake and me and my boy gonna eat it and we're gonna die." He said, you go ahead and take care of me first and God's going to take care of you. Now, God didn't give that widow flour and, and flour and oil and all this stuff just running over. No, he simply caused her meal barrel not to go empty and her cruise of oil not to go empty. She still, I'm sure, for the remainder of that three years was awed every time she went to the oil and every time she went to the meal barrel that there was meal and oil left to cook again. She trusted God moment by moment. And then, oh, see, if you're trusting God, boy, you're going to be healthy, wealthy, and wise. Look at there. She never run out of food. Yeah, but God let her son die. But in the midst of these difficulties, God proves himself strong to different people in different ways. In this case, God raised the son up. In other cases, God may give you grace through some loss such as that. Then in chapter 18, no, in chapter, yeah, in chapter 18, um, 
God tells Elijah to go find um, King Ahab. And I can never remember this guy's name. Let me look at it real quick. First Kings chapter 18. The Lord had a servant that was in Ahab's house. Obadiah was his name. And so <clears throat> Obadiah, it hadn't rained in, in, in three years. And, and the king and Obadiah leave the the, the, the castle, if you will, the, the, the throne room, go in different directions looking for uh, food for their horses and their livestock and so forth. And uh, Elijah comes up on Obadiah and he said, hey, go tell Ahab I want to talk to him. And Obadiah said, hey, listen, boss, I, I, I know I work for the king, but I've actually been taking care of 7,000 of your, your, your fellow preachers uh, and, and if I'm not going to tell, uh, Ahab you're here because God's going to, going to just carry you away to protect you. And then he's going to kill me for being a liar. And a Elijah said, as the Lord God liveth, I will talk to him. So, uh, Obadiah goes and gets Ahab. Ahab comes up on Elijah and said, oh, here's the one that's troubling Israel. And Elijah said, no, you're the one that's troubling Israel because you've turned them away from God, basically. Hey, let's have a competition. Let's get your, you get all your, your prophets of Baal. Baal is a plural term, so it's prophets to this, this pluralistic set of gods that you serve now. And you put them on Mount Carmel. I'm going to get on Mount Carmel. We'll see who sent Carmel and we'll see who sends fire down. So Elijah lets them, uh, Elijah lets them go first and basically harasses them all day. Oh, maybe your God's asleep. Maybe you need to yell a little louder. Finally, towards the end of the day, he repaired the altar. He put the, the offering on the altar. He put the wood on the altar, then the offering on the altar. Then he dug a ditch around the altar and had them pour 12. Now, water was, was very... Uh, sought after, very expensive because it hadn't rained in three years. But he poured 12 barrels of water on it and he played a, prayed a very short prayer, basically, Lord, so they'll know that you are God and I am your servant, please send down fire. And I could just see him backing up as he's praying that and the fire comes down, consumes the offering and the wood and the stones and the water and the whole nine yards. God proved himself strong there. Uh, you see, he stood for the Lord. He proclaimed the word of the Lord, standing for the Lord. He was sustained by the Lord. He repaired the altar. He preached the word of the Lord again. And a whole nation turned back to Christ. Humility, praying, seeking the Lord, turning from wicked ways. When Elijah finished, when God finished working through Elijah, the people said, the Lord, he is the God. The Lord, he is the God. He stood for the Lord. He was sustained by the Lord. He preached the word of the Lord and the Lord of the word used him mightily. The Lord hadn't changed. Sinners haven't changed. It's the saints who've changed. Hmm. We also know about payday someday. Uh, Ahab really wanted to buy Naboth's vineyard. Naboth wouldn't sell it to him because it was his birthright. It's this is my my dad, my granddad, my great granddad, all the way back to jo the days of Joshua and Caleb lived on this land. I'm not selling it to you. So uh, Jezebel uh, hired some liars to go lie and say that Naboth had had blasphemed and he was stoned to death, and Ahab got the garden. As soon as Ahab walks in the garden, old Elijah walks up and said. 
Payday someday, the Lord's going to get you. Everybody knows you lied about this, and God knows you lied about this. He's going to get you. Some years later, Josiah and Ahab are going to go to battle. And Micah is the prophet who said, basically, you're going to die today. So Ahab did, maybe not for the same reasons, but something that General Ulysses S. Grant did in the American Civil War. He typically wore the not the uniform of a general, but the uniform of a private. No markings, no badges, no stars, none of that. So Ahab goes out, not dressed like the king, but just dressed like the average soldier. Soldier, And as God would have it, a random archer throws a random arrow, arrow in the air, and it gets him between the shoulder blades, and he dies. And when Elijah told him he was going to die, he said, the two, uh, Ahab, the dogs are going to drink your blood and the, they're going to eat your wife's flesh. And so when he struck him, when he was struck by the arrow, he told his driver to take him to the throne. Basically, I'm mortally wounded. Get me out of here. He died. His blood is dripping out of the chariot he's in and the dogs licked it up. Somebody looks up and said, who's on the Lord's side? Two people stuck their head out the window and said, we are. He said, throw down that woman then. And they threw Jezebel down and the dogs ate everything but her hands and her head, the wicked deeds and the wicked thoughts. Payday someday, all right? Uh, <clears throat> Let's keep going here. Special features is the death of David, the request for wisdom, the dedication of the temple, the queen of Sheba. She came to see all of Solomon's uh, wealth, and she said the half had not been told her. The divide, division of the kingdom, the conflict at, at Carmel, which we just talked about, Naboth's vineyard, the aimless, nameless bowman that took Ahab's life. Uh, the occasion, Solomon led the kingdom to its largest size and glory, but his strange or foreign wives led him to a divided allegiance. He still called himself a believer in Jehovah, but he followed after these other gods as well. His great zeal for God became diminished so much that he actually worshiped God and the gods of his wife. Some say it was Rehoboam or Jeroboam that caused a divided kingdom, but the fact of the matter is Solomon's divided heart led to a divided house, which led to a divided kingdom. You reap what you sow. You reap more than you sow, and it takes a little time. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. In one sentence, spiritual decline led to moral and political decay and defeat. Okay? The pictures and prophecies of Christ, the wisdom of Solomon, God's heart gives Solomon such wisdom is a picture of God giving his son Jesus the full splendor and glory of God. Jesus is, in fact, the personification of wisdom. The splendor and glory of Solomon are personified in Christ. We see that in Matthew chapter 12. Elijah's prophetic words and work. A lot of people wanted to know if Jesus was Elisha or Elias, Elijah or Elias come back in the flesh, okay? See the United Kingdom, chapters 1 to 11, the divided kingdom in chapters 12 to 22, all right? That, my friends, is 1 Kings. And we covered 2 Samuel. So let's look here at Ephesians. Ephesians is one of my favorite books of the Bible. Ephesians is all about Christ and his church. Uh, the key verses are uh, chapter 2, verses 8 to 10. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that, the antecedent of this pronoun is that noun. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that, the faith, is not of yourselves. The faith is the gift of God. The faith is not of works, lest any man should boast. Why? For or because we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Okay? Christ in the church. We see that really in chapter 5, um, verse about 20 and following, where he breaks out, a man should love his wife like Christ loved the church. This book was written by the Apostle Paul about A.D. 60 or 61 
to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. The distinctive points is this is Paul's great prison masterpiece. It is a grand canyon of scripture. It's broader, it's deeper, it's more beautiful than most any other piece of scripture. There are no controversies dealt with. It rather centers on the person and work of Christ and what or who we, his followers, should be. It was written in Rome while he's under house arrest. It was kind of a follow-up to a well-established, outstanding church. We can read about that in, in Acts 18 to 20. Uh, only epistle that also has a letter written to it in Revelation. Church, The church was established, just said that a second ago. Paul was so concerned that he called the elders before him in chapter 20 to warn of attacks that would arise from within. He says in couple of amazing things there in Acts chapter 20. He says, let's just go over and look at it real quick, okay? He says that God shed his own blood for the church. That's pretty important. That'll bust a Jehovah's Witness in the mouth who says Christ is a creation and not actually God. From Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church, the elders, the pastors, okay, the married men with children. Um, and when they were come to him, he said, you know, from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I've been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with humility of mind and with many tears and temptations, which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews. And I kept, how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. And now behold, I go bound in the spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and affliction abide me. In other words, Bonds and affliction are waiting on me there, but I think this is where I'm supposed to go. So I'm going there, even though the Holy Spirit keeps telling me I'm going to get in trouble when I get there. They're going to jail me. They might even kill me, which eventually they did. Now, look in verse 24. None of these things move me. All these people telling me uh, that the Holy Spirit showed them that I was going to die in Jerusalem, it doesn't move me because this is why I feel like God. I feel like God wants me to go there. I don't count my life dear to myself. Why? So that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I've received with the Lord Jesus to testify of the gospel of the grace of God, the good news of the grace of God. And now behold, I know that ye all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. Wherefore, I take you directly to state that I'm pure from the blood of all men. Why is he pure from the blood of all men? This may be an allusion to Ezekiel 33, where the Lord said, I set you as a watchman in the land. If you blow the trumpet and people don't listen, they will die in their sins and their blood be upon them. But if you fail to blow the trumpet, they die in their sins, but I will require their blood at your hands. Paul's saying, hey, God's not going to require your blood at my hands. Because I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. Must have been a big church, multiple pastors. To feed the church of God, which he, God, hath purchased with his own blood. I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. This still happens today. People come in the church, they act like they're all this and that, and next thing you know, they're, 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 they're drawing men away because they're leading them away with perverse things. Therefore, watch and remember that by the space of three years, I cease not to warn you, warn everyone night and day with tears. And now, brethren, I commend you to God. Okay, so he knew this trouble was going to come. He warned them that it was going to come. He warned them night and day with tears. He's headed to, to uh, Rome because he feels like that's what God wants him to do, but he knows he's probably going to die at Rome. So the distinctive points. Paul's great chrism. Uh, oh, we talked about that. Let's look at the main words and phrases. 
in Christ, in him, we find 12 times. Church, nine times. Heavenly places, four times. Ephesians chapter 2 says we are presently seated with him in heavenly places. Man, that means we're as sure for heaven as if we were already there. The word riches we see five times and glory eight times. The main purpose of this book, oops, the main purpose of this book was to teach them to maintain love and doctrinal purity. Chapter four is really good. It talks about putting off the old man, putting on the new man, being renewed in your spirit day by day. But it also talks about God gave pastors and teachers to our age, apostles to begin with and on down till you get to us, pastors and teachers, uh, until we all come into the unity of faith and to the measure of the stature of a perfect man, which is Jesus Christ. And that we should continue, we won't be tossed about with every wind of doctrine, but we will, uh, we won't be tossed about with every wind of doctrine, but we will speak the truth in love, right? Um, the main purpose is to teach them to maintain love and doctrinal purity, even though there's heresy everywhere. Uh, recently had somebody leave the church. Uh, and according to them, they left the church uh, because of uh, they, they, they don't doctrinally agree with us. Hey, I can't compromise in order to maintain the number of people in the flock. That is just proof that what Paul said what happened at the church of Ephesus can happen anywhere. The main uh, outline here is our heritage in Christ in chapters 1 to 3 and our life in Christ, chapters 4 to 6. We see the spiritual blessings in the first part of chapter 1. We see the prayer for wisdom in the second part of chapter 1. We see once dead, now alive in chapter 2. We see Paul's testimony of God's gift in chapter 3. In chapters 4 to 6, we see our life in Christ, preserving the unity in chapter 4. A daily walk of a Christian, chapter 4 on into chapter 5. Our conduct in the Christian home, chapter 5, 21, talking about husbands love their wife as Christ loved the church through 6, 9, which covers children obeying their parents in all things. And the Christian armor, all right? Other remarks, the entire book seems to be one long thought. There are many one-sentence paragraphs which I've listed out here for you. Most of you have these notes. There's the prayer for enlightenment in chapter one, uh, the prayer for empowerment in chapter three, the prayer of salvation in chapter two, uh, the one way only in chapter four, the greatest passage on husband and wife is in the last part of chapter five, uh, children and parents, chapters one to four, uh, chapter six, verses one to four, and uh, the armor of God, chapter 6, verses 10 to 18. That is a survey. I mean, scratching the surface of the book of Ephesians. The book of Philippians is also likewise. There's no condemnation for the church at uh, Philippi anywhere in that. It's all about what a great church it is. It shows us Christ our life in chapter one. He's the source of our fruit. He's the source of our science. He's the subject of our sermon. He's the sole motivation to live and serve or leave and see for me to live as Christ, to die as gain. All right. Uh, chapter two is Christ our Lord. Uh, he is the, the motivation for our harmony uh, within the church. He is the master of all souls whether uh, they accept him or don't accept him, one day they will profess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He's the motivation for our service. In chapter three, we see him as our love. Paul is, talks about his pedigree, but he said, my pedigree is not important. The right perception is anything but Christ is dung. Uh, the right priority is I want to know Christ, the fellowship of the sufferings, the, the uh, being made conformable to his death and so forth. And the right persistence is, I press towards the mark. Too many of us kind of sit down after a certain point. Some of us sit down as soon as we get saved. Some of us sit down and serve for a little while and say, no, now it's time for somebody else to serve. No, there's no place in God's plan for retirement until we get to heaven. Amen. And so we see Christ our Lord, uh, Christ our love. We see Christ our lot or our supply in chapter 
4. Uh, we want to have peace? Well, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and souls. We want to be contentment. Well, Paul said, I've learned in what sort of state I am therewith to be content. Uh, we want to do all things. Uh, you know, the Bible commands us to be full and to be hungry, to be abased and to abound. And Paul said, in that context of being both things, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's not talking about uh, sports and so forth like we so often see it used today. It's talking about living the Christian life appropriately. Uh, God supplies all of our needs. Paul said to the church at Philippi, which is the chief city of Macedonia, remember in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, he said of the churches of Macedonia to Corinth, we want to do you to wit. We make you aware. We do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed upon the churches of Macedonia. How did in a great trial of affliction and their deep poverty abounded to the riches of their, riches of their liberality uh, and, and their joy. So basically, they were very poor, and they were persecuted, but they were joyous and begging Paul to take money from them for the cause of the ministry. And Paul said, they did this not as we hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. All right? Paul said to that kind of Christian, the Christian who is maybe persecuted and maybe poor, but puts Christ first in all things, my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. All right, another key, uh, let's look at the key verses. We have chapter 2, 10, and 11, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, things in earth, things in heaven, and things in earth, and things under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of the glory of God the Father. That's basically saved, might get saved, never going to get saved. They're still going to confess and kneel before God to admit that Jesus Christ is Lord. Chapter 4, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice, all right? This is the theme. The letter was written probably 62 or 63. It's likely the next to the last book that he wrote, the last book being uh, 2 Timothy. The distinctive points, this is Paul's love letter to the churches of Philippi. It's informal informal, it's personal, it's affectionate, and it's reminiscent. He's remembering how they've helped him from time to time. There are no Old Testament quotes. There's only 65 vocabulary words. It's daily living at hand, not doctrine. There's no controversy. Paul's been saved for 25 years. He has no more sermons to preach, no more churches to plant, and only one more book to write. He just wants to know Christ more closely, more intimately. He's written this from the Roman prison right before he has his head chopped off. By the way, I want to point out that the book ends, the saints that be at Rome greet thee, chiefly they that be of Caesar's household. He's talking about the Praetorium Guard. They're guarding him before he gets his head chopped off, and he's winning them to Christ. Amen. No matter what's going on in your life, you can touch others for Christ. The main words and phrases are rejoice, joy, and in Christ. He sent Timothy and Epaphroditus to Philippi, because he wanted, and he wanted them to be well received. The main purpose of the book is to teach them to put Christ first at the center of everyday life. This uh, is Paul's look at the transformed life, misery to melody, prison to palace, hated Roman soldiers to heaven-bound souls. There's a little typo here. I'm trying to get my... I want to fix that. Hated, and, ah, oh, come on, Holman, and hell-bound Roman soldiers. To heaven-bound souls. In need of a savior. It's still not exactly right, is it?
All right, that's a little better. Now, I've already given you the outline, Christ our Lord. He's the source of our science, the source of our fruit, the subject of our sermon, the sole motivation, and the source of our stout heartedness or our bravery. Uh, oh, boy, I don't know what I did there, but that ain't right. Let's go back up here. Christ our Lord, he's the manner, manner, manner of our similitude or our association, our harmony, the model for all saints, the master of all souls, and the motivation for our service. We see Christ our Lord, love, the right perception, the right priority, and the right persistent, Christ our lot. He's the court of peace, outer peace and inner peace, contentment complete, the constructor of the impossible and the constraints of our concerns. The uh, other remarks is Philippians is more personal than Ephesians and it's more peaceful than Galatians. It's less controversial than Colossians and less doctrinal than practical. The famous verses 1 6, and he which hath begun a good work in you uh, shall continue it until the day of Jesus Christ. Verse 21, to live as Christ, to die as gain. 2 10 to 16 is uh, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Wherefore, my beloved brother, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, that doesn't mean you go to heaven one way and I go to heaven another. That means if I'm saved, the Holy Spirit's in my soul and it shall work out to my hands so I'll do what he wants me to do. My feet, I go where he wants me to go. I ears, my ears, I listen to what he wants me to listen to. My eyes, I watch what he wants me to watch. I read what he wants me to read. My mouth, I say what he wants me to say. I eat what he wants me to eat. You got it? All right. Uh, why? Because it's God that worketh in you both to do his, both to will and to do his good pleasure. So if I want to do something right, it's God working in me. If I manage to do something right, it's God working in me. Why do I do this? So I can say I'm better than the next guy? No, so that I can be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation holding forth the word of life. Uh, chapter 3, 14, I pressed towards the mark for the high calling of Jesus Christ. Chapter 4, uh, verse uh, 6 is pray about nothing and, and, excuse me, worry about nothing, pray about everything. Chapter 7, uh, that the uh, the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds. Uh, chapter uh, 4, and verse 13, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Chapter 19, my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. And chapter and verse 20 is kind of the amen of life. Uh, three famous stories to note about Philippi, Lydia, the seller of purple, Paul and Silas in prison, and the Philippian jailer. Okay, God actually began that flock there at Philippi with a woman. Then Paul and Silas end up getting beaten and thrown in jail. And instead of complaining like me and you, they're singing hymns. God sends an earthquake, opens it up. The jailer runs in thinking everybody's run away. He's ready to kill himself. And Paul says, do thyself no harm. We are all present, basically. And he's able to lead the man to Christ, not just the man, but his entire family. Men, that's very important. When we can reach the husband, we will very likely reach the entire family. All right, uh, two famous other passages are five to eight, let this man be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, and seven to 16 of chapter three, which is the right priority, uh, perception priority, and pers persistence is all in that section there. All right, that is Philippians, which I think might be my very favorite New Testament book. Now, let's move on to the doctrines. We have covered the doctrine of, of bibliology, which took us several weeks. Uh, when we look at the Baptist distinctives, the Bible is the sole authority for faith and practice, the autonomy of the local church, the priesthood of the believer, two offices, pastor and deacon, individual soul liberty, saved church membership, to ordinances, not sacraments. There's no saving value to them. Ordinances, commands, things that we're supposed to do. Believers' baptism by immersion and the Lord's Supper and separation of church and state. You have never seen a state or a country uh, that is controlled by Baptists that persecuted 
the people who didn't agree with them. All the way back from the little Baptist state, Rhode Island, Roger Williams' view was, it's the Holy Spirit's job to save them. If they don't agree with me, I'm not going to, forcing them is not going to help any, any matter. So there was totally, total religious freedom there in that place. All right. Those are the Baptist distinctives, Baptist distinctives. So we started with the Bible as the only authority for faith and practice. And then we moved to theology proper, where we looked at God in general. We even looked at the names of God and the combinations of names of God, Jehovah Shalom, Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Sidkenu, etc. And then we move, now we're moving into Christology, which is the doctrine of Christ, the person of working Christ. The person, who is Christ? The work, what did Christ do? His character, his work, the cross. His deity, his work, his death. His person stepping down from his glory, his work shedding of his blood. His person, he was and is the God man. He was 100% God and 100% man, yet without sin. He was the eternal son of God, and yet he reduced himself to be born of a virgin. As God, he never had an impure heart or an ounce a thought, an inclination of sin. As a man, he wept, he hungered, he thirsted. He was subject to discomfort. Uh, he was subject to cursing. He was subject to filthiness. All men are subject to these things, but he was without sin. He is pictured in the Bible, in the Ark of the Covenant. It pictures the God man, wood, humanity, covered in gold, deity, the law, the word of God is within. It was uh, outside was angels' wings overspread it. Angels were present at Jesus' birth, at his death, at his temptation, at his baptism, at his resurrection, at his, at his ascension. He is seen in everything in the Bible. I mean, I could sit here and tell you all kind of ways about the tabernacle. The furniture of the tabernacle set up in the shape of a cross. There's a big white wall all the way around it representing anybody within that tabernacle had to be pure, okay? But there's only one door. That door went directly to the altar and then the laver. And then you had the table of showbread, the candlestick and the table of incense. And then you had the, the mercy seat. All that's up in the shape of a cross. There's only one door. That one door had four coverings. Uh, that uh, correlate with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew is written from the Jewish perspective. It shows us, shows us D, Jesus as the the uh, the king of Israel, as the lion of the tribe of Judah. Well, one of those coverings was purple, which is the color of de uh, excuse me, the color of <coughs> royalty. And Jesus is seen as in Mark as the sacrificial uh, son of God, uh, <coughs> the sacrificial servant of God. Well, the color of sacrifice is red in blood. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. One of those coverings was red. One of those coverings was white. In Luke, we see the sinless son of man. In John, we see the heavenly origins of salvation. One of those covers was blue. You enter through, he said, I am the door. You enter through the door, the first thing you see is the sacrifice. For us, that would be Christ's cross. Uh, then the laver. You cannot serve in this world without getting a little dirty. Jesus girded himself and washed the disciples' feet. Peter said, you can't wash my feet. Jesus said, if I don't wash your feet, you got no place with me. Peter said, well, then wash me all over. He said, you don't need to be washed all over. In other words, you're already born again. You just need to wash your feet. So for us, that's 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You go to the, the, the candlestick. Jesus said, as long as I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. But then he said to us, ye are the light of the world. So we should be shedding the light of Christ, uh, reflecting the light of Christ, if you will. The table of showbread. Man shall not live by bread alone, Christ said, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. The table of incense. This represents our prayers. Okay, and you go to the mercy seat. We can come boldly before the throne to obtain grace and find mercy to help in time, uh, no, obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need.
Okay, everything about the Old Testament is pointing to Christ. Augustine, way back in between 354 and 4, whatever, when he died, said that everything that is revealed in the New Testament is concealed in the Old Testament. The whole Bible from Genesis forward is a love story pointing us to the Savior of all mankind, Jesus Christ. Uh, he is the only reason we have hope of going to heaven. He keeps us from sorrowing and without hope, uh, uh, his work, not not the work of healing, but the cross work. He serves as the mediator between God and men, bringing us into God's presence. First uh, Timothy chapter 2 says there's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Uh, chapter 8 of Romans, one of my favorite chapters. It starts with, there's no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. So you don't threaten me with hell because it's not even possible. There is no condemnation. Don't threaten me with a tribulation period, amen, because that, that's, a, that's a period of judgment, and there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. Uh, chapter uh, 8 and verse 14, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Uh, the, 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 the things that we now suffer are not worthy to be co compared with the glory that are going to be revealed in us. Uh, verse 26, when we don't know how to pray, the Holy Spirit that knows the will of God is making intercession for us. He's praying for us. Verse 34, uh, who is it that uh, condemns? It's Christ. Whoever liveth to make intercession for us, and the chapter closes out, that nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. He's the mediator that brings us in. He reaches down. I love that old song. He, when he reached down for me, he had to reach way down to save me, the old song says. He takes man's hand and God's hand and joins us together. Uh, we remain inseparable from him. He said, I will never leave thee. I will never forsake thee. It wouldn't matter if God walked on earth if God had not died. It would not matter if he had died like hundreds of others if he was not the Christ. He died, yes, but he got up on that third day proving he was God and that he did die for our sins. His person and his work together make us justified. If he wasn't God, we're not justified. If he didn't go to the cross, we're not justified. Um, his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many by his knowledge. I determine not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. You cannot separate his person and his work, okay? 2 Corinthians 5, 21, he hath made him to be sin, sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So they is his person and work. We cannot separate them. If he's not God, we're not justified. If he didn't get up on that third day, we're not justified. God died for us. Amen. Uh, 2 Peter 3, 18, Christ also hath once suffered uh, <clears throat> for the sins, the just for the unjust. I'm going to make a little note here to help us understand this better. He is his person and work. Okay. The summary of the incarnation. If he wasn't who he was, it would not have mattered what he did. Thousands died on crosses, but Christ validated his death on Calvary when he got up on that third day. Who he was would not have mattered had he not died for us. If he hadn't died a vicarious death, it would not have mattered that he came to earth. The old rugged cross was different because of it was God who hung on the cross. All right, let's keep going. The career of Christ, his pre-incarnate person. You know, a lot of people falsely say today that Christ came to be at Bethlehem. No, he's co-equal, co-existent, co-eternal with God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We see it all the way back in Genesis. Let us make man in our own image, male and female created he them. The word Elohim is a plural word that takes a singular verb. Uh, Elohim created the heavens and the earth there, there in, in Genesis chapter one. God created the heavens and the earth. <clears throat> John 1.1 1, 1 presents three things about Christ's pre-incarnate person. In the beginning was God, 
excuse me, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So the distinction of personality, Christ is with God. The word, indi the word with indicates that there has to be more than Word. The Word, the Son, God, the Father, the Holy Spirit is not mentioned there because the Holy Spirit doesn't speak of himself. The equality of essence, Christ is equal to God. The Word was God, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The eternality of existence, Christ is just as eternal as God. This relationship existed long before the very first beginning in Genesis chapter 1. They, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, these three are one, the New Testament tells us, and the three in one God existed before in eternity past. He will exist continually through eternity future. This is indicated by the tense of every verbal notion, the tense being imperfect, meaning no fixed point of beginning and no fixed point of ending. Let's look at the career of Christ continued, his incarnation and sinless life. His incarnation means in fleshing. He came to live in flesh. Okay, introductions and definitions. Theanthropic union means... The God-man, God and man perfectly joined together in one person. Hypostatic union, that is beneath change. For this God-man to change is beneath him. God, man, God and man are joined in one person forever. That one person is Christ, all right? Three necessary elements of the statements about his incarnation, his undiminished deity. He was all God, 100% God, his true genuine humanity. But we have to clarify that yet without sin. He was all man, yet without sin. He was 100% man, yet without sin. These two natures are forever joined together in one person. We see that in Hebrews 7, 26. For such an high priest became us who is holy, blame, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, made higher than the heavens. The theological question about incarnation, the no reputation problem, the emptying problem, the kenosis problem. Jesus took everything and poured it out and became a man. But what did he pour out? He didn't stop being God, and nor did he gain a bad reputation because he did not Stop being God to the shepherds or to the wise men. The answer, Jesus emptied himself of the free and independent exercise of his deity, of his ability to do anything that he wanted to do at any time. He did not always know everything. He limited to the, he limited himself to, to possess human characteristics. That's why the Bible tells us as a boy that he, he waxed greater uh, in knowledge and in the sight of men. He learned like other children, and yet he was a sinless God in human flesh, all right? He suffered the infirmities of a sinner. He got hungry. He had to sleep. He got tired, right? We're looking at the, the, the career of Christ, the reasons for the, the incarnation, to confirm God's promises from way back in Genesis chapter 3. On the very day that man sinned, God promised a deliverer, and Christ coming to Bethlehem is the culmination of that promise. This is the beginning of a series of hundreds of promises about the Savior. Before man sinned, it was determined, predetermined by God, that Jesus Christ would be the Lamb. That's why Revelation calls him the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Only God knew this. But we got in on it through the promises, the pictures, the types, the prophecies. Uh, the, the second reason for the incarnation is to reveal the Father. Okay, John 1.18, no man that's seen God at any time. Uh, <clears throat> Moses was the closest man to God in Numbers chapter 12. The Bible says that God said, I will speak to Moses like a man doth his friend face to face. Yet, he was not allowed to see the face of God. He was allowed to see the hinder parts of God, and yet his face glowed because of it. Uh, no man will know God unless they've met Christ. John 14, John 1, 14, the word was made flesh 
and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Hebrews 1, 3, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. To become a faithful high priest among men, Hebrews chapter 5, this is the uh, third reason for the incarnation, to become a faithful high priest. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him, called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. All right. A priests used to deal with people as if they should be perfect when they themselves were not perfect. Priests should have compassion on those who have not experienced the same things and whose sin is no worse than their own. Priests were called and ordained of God. The incarnation of Christ made him a candidate and a fulfillment of what a high priest should be. Christ was and is the perfect high priest and to put away sin. Now once in the end hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Our sin is ever present with us. But we can be forgiven and cleansed time and again because Christ has put away our sin. Unless our sin is put away, we'll have a hard time being a good Christian. Okay? And to destroy the devil, Hebrews 2, 14 and 15, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. All right? First John uh, 3, 8, for the purpose of the Son of God was manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil. To give an example of a holy life. He that saith that abideth in him, that he abideth in him, ought himself so to walk even as he walked. In other words, what would Jesus do? Walk this way. Uh, Christ suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow in his step. Uh to prepare for the second advent or the second coming. So Christ was offered once, Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. The stages of salvation. Right now we're saved from the penalty of sin. We're in the process of being saved from the power of sin as we submit moment by moment to his Holy Spirit. When Christ appears, we will be saved from the very presence of sin. And we're going to stop right there and we will pick up right here on page eight on Tuesday.